able to join us. Um, we are recording this because people have contacted us to say that there's load shedding and they're not going to be able to stay the whole time. Um, I think you just need to check for us in, for muting, please. Um, so they're not going to be able to stay the whole time or there's load shedding or they're going to arrive late. And so we've just got this variety of people from all over the country and all over the world, actually. I think we've got quite a few people from um, um, other countries. Um, and to just allow people to, to show up and be with us, we are going to do what we normally do in, uh, for all Symphonia events. And that is to just connect as human beings before we go into a kind of doing mode. So um, Tasnim is going to create um, uh, breakout rooms for, for each, everybody to go into a breakout room with three, two or three amazing people. So the one thing I can promise you that if you end up in a breakout room with anybody who's on registered for today's call, it will be interesting people. It will be the kind of people that you want to hang out with. So uh, just that opportunity to go into a small breakout room with a few uh, wonderful people. And when you go into the breakout room, the invitation is to do two things. One is to say to the other two people who you are, what, where you live, what organization you're with, what's your day job. So whatever way you want to introduce yourself. And then secondly, um, say to the other people, why did you decide to join today? So when I ask you that question, it's part of the... It's, it's underpinned by our theory of change around 70, 2010. So we'll come back and we'll talk about that when you come back. But um, the starting invitation now is for you to say to two or three other people, why did you decide to join today? So I think, Tasneem, we're probably ready to now get people into the breakout rooms. And you're going to have in your breakout room, there's going to be, it's going to be seven minutes. So we literally going to ask you to just hang out for seven minutes and then we'll bring everybody back and um, we'll hear something about what you discussed in your breakup room. But Taz, are we ready to go to the breakup rooms? We are. I'll open shortly. So you should get an invitation on your screen to, to say accept invitation to go to the breakout room. Breakout rooms open, Taz? They are open. Okay, so if you could just ac ac um, accept that invitation and uh, we'll bring you back in seven minutes. Enjoy your conversation. So good morning, everybody. As you arrive, we are just assigning you to a breakout room uh, with an invitation to just go and have a conversation with um, two or three other wonderful people and tell them why did you decide to join the session today? So if you could just accept that invitation to go to a breakout room. Um, then um, we'll bring you back in about seven minutes. So can I see those people who haven't accepted the invitation to go to the breakout room? Is there a, is there a problem or is amazing? Oh, I have um, I have been quite nervous about the session. I've been curious about why am I so nervous, and I realise it's because I really want this. I want the session to kind of have land and have impact, and so it's wonderful for me to see uh, lots of people on the call who I know well. Hello, Mel. It's lovely to see you, and um, a large number of people from our Partners Possibility community. So welcome to them too. <clears throat> So I want to ask you as a starting point and as a way for us to get a sense of this kind of communal perspective to share in the chat um, just maybe one or two kind of ideas about why did you come? What is it that you came to learn? And when you do that, that's part of the kind of virtual adult learning experience because it's how you have a voice and how you contribute and how you show up as a co-owner and a co-producer of this experience. So personally, um, it makes the 
it makes a, a massive difference for me when I look at the chat after the session and I start to connect people with particular interest and so it will be it's a gift to me and then a gift to the rest of the community when because lots of people have said I'm coming to find out what people what other people are struggling with and what their questions are and what they want so if you share in the chat why you came it's an act of generosity and um, and we're inviting you to 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 step up in that space and I just want to say to Motlokwa who just said I want to understand the theory of 70 20 to 10 because it, I'm hearing it for the first time that question opens up a pathway for me to speak into which will be very different if I just if, if we just had the for example the conversation with Daryl who is very intimately um, um, in tune with 70 20 10 so it just helps us to understand what is the range of questions that people have. Um, it was wonderful to uh, hear some people, some people had the chance to respond back to my question around what do you want and um, I built as much as that into the program. So yeah, so thank you for everybody. I'm going to, I'm going to read as, as we go and I'm also going to ask my colleagues who are on the call if anybody sees something that I might be missing and, and you think I need to focus on to just kind of bring my my awareness to this. I'm just quickly looking at what people are saying. And it's just wonderful, all these, um, all these expectations and requests. So our promise for today's session was that I'm going to be sharing and I'm going to invite my colleagues to add their voices to my sharing, to share the lessons learned from 10 years of facilitating one of the largest um, 70 20 10 programs in the world. So as far as we know, partners possibility, um, we have had um, so far about 3,800 participants over 10 years. And it's very, very rare for these programs to run for such a long period of time. So, so we are, we feel particularly blessed because we've been able to uh, develop the thinking and and hone our thoughts over the last 10 years around how these programs work. So um, there are some people who are brand new to the idea of 702010. So let me just quickly um, tell you about that. I did a presentation at the ODN, the Organizational Development Network Conference last week. Um, and in the room was someone who's done her, P who did a PhD on 702010. And she kind of stopped me right in the middle of my sentence. She said, Louise, I think I need to help you here. So she gave, the, gave all of us a kind of lecture on 702010. We don't have time today for a lecture on 702010. So just uh, very quickly, um, it was developed in 1987, this idea uh, by Morgan McCall and his colleagues at the Center for Creative Leadership. And what they did at the time is they looked at uh, what do people learn from? And they discovered, and this is their ratio at the time. I'm not, I don't believe that this ratio is a precise kind of ratio. It's just, it gives us, it's, 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 it's something for us to think about. So what they found at the time is that 70% of learning happens from on the job experience. 20% happens from social sources and 10% from formal education. That was what they came up with in 1987. Now, it has become a bit of a, a kind of topic for many people. Um, Charles Jennings and his colleagues founded the 702010 Institute, if anybody's interested in, in that. I mean, they, they ran amazing conferences. I had the privilege to attend some of their conferences. Uh, Charles also gave us um, a, a beautiful endorsement for our latest book. Uh, he said, um, he said that, that what we've done is kind of modeling how 702010 can be taken into practice. Um, and then um, a guy called Tom Whelan started to do some research a while ago. And he, his research was, to, was kind of specifically to say, is that ratio, you know, it, how important is that ratio? Uh, and, and he came up with a new ratio, which is the right, which he calls 55, 25, 20, based on, on, on recent research. Vandra, the 10% is formal training. So that's what we used to call, you know, sending people off to a business school or having them in a classroom. It's having a facilitator in front of the room. That's the 10%. 
So Tom Williams research in 2018 across, I think, 1,600 organizations says, oh, no, maybe the ratio should be 55, 25, 20. And we had a session last year with, with um, Julian Birkinshaw at London Business School. He said he thought it should be 50, 30, 20. So I don't, I'm personally not all that fussed about the exact ratio. The point is that learning will and should happen through a variety of, of processes. There's some learning that happens from doing and from reflecting on doing. So that's the on the job. I personally think about it as learning from own experience, uh, so to take our own experience seriously. Some learning will come from interacting with other people. That's the social, and we're going to dig deeper into that. And then there's formal training, which is what we've always known. We've always called you know, training or leadership development. It's getting people into a classroom or into a room with another group of people with typically a facilitator at the front of the room. So, um, so why does it matter? It matters because we all, I think, on this call, the kind of people on this call have a dream for an alternative future. We have a dream for a world where people can live their best lives at work, where their eyes are shining. So we think we, for Symphonia, the, the key performance indicator is shining eyes. If people's eyes are shining, uh, then the chances are they're going to go home and they're going to be good parents. And they're going to be, be kind to their other family members. And they're going to support their children at school. And they're going to be good citizens. But if they go home having had their energy depleted, they go home and they kick the cat and shout at the kids and they're not very nice to their partners. So our dream is a world that's more kinder and more compassionate. And so, and we know that, that leaders have a massive impact on what happens at work. And so we care about leadership development, I think all of us. So um, traditionally, we've been putting a lot of effort and emphasis on the formal training part. We've been sending people to business school. Uh, we've been arranging training sessions. We've had, you know, all these trainers and facilitators, etc. But what I'm hearing, and I'd be very curious to hear your perspective and, and sharing your perspective in, this, um, in the chat now would be amazing. Um, I'm hearing from clients who say, it's not working. They're saying we're not getting the return on investment, um, especially not from a lot of the leadership development activities that are happening. They say, um, our clients go, they love the course, they come back, but it's not translating in behavioral change. The leaders are as unconscious and uncaring as before. They say all the right things in the training session, but their teams have not seen any change. The learning doesn't seem to be sticky. So I'm curious to hear whether anybody on this call have heard, whether you agree or whether maybe you have, you've, figured out how to do this in a way that 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 means you do get the return on investment so and and I'm gonna we just want to have a little bit of pause now to hear some thoughts from from people and to and the way that you can um, you can either indicate that you want to say something is just unmute yourself and I see Mel has unmuted herself so you can either just unmute yourself or put your virtual hand up but uh, firstly Mel and then we'll go to Janine after Mel Mel uh, Louise, many years ago, um, in my coaching training, um, I remember Mark Steinberg telling a story about, you know, this, this kind of problem that we face. And I then went on some other training with JT Fox many years after that. And I remember sitting in this training going, oh my word, none of this is sticking at all. Like, I don't know, I, I, I was probably just not ready for it. But I remember Mark Steinberg saying that if one thing sticks through a whole workshop, that one thing can change your life. So I've always gone into whatever with like, what is the one thing that is going to change my life? And also when I go into a training environment saying, you know, if one thing here changes, one thing sticks, it could change your life. And so I think it's unrealistic for us as facilitators or participants to expect a big big impact, we will shrink back. We, we change over those few days and then we shrink back many to our original selves. But if one thing sticks, so 
you know, I think that's like almost a different goal to go for. That's just my. Thanks, Mel. That's one perspective. Let's hear. So we had um, Janine was unmuted and then we'll hear from Liz. Liz, it's lovely to have you here all the way from Bristol, I think, is where you are at the moment. But first, Janine from MediClinic. Thank you. So we've learned through PFP that reflection is very important and that sometimes people don't realize that they've learned something because they don't reflect. So we are focusing much more recently on so what have you learned the last week and i'm practicing that in my sessions with the people reporting to me as well and it makes them aware of that we learn more every day that we learn in, than what we learn in formal training so janine thank you I, by the way i didn't ask janine to say this janine has just just demonstrated something for all of us janine was on partners for possibility and as a leader uh, she didn't learn about reflecting in a formal classroom. She learned about reflecting because it was part of the, the whole program. And now it's kind of put, it's, it's become sticky and it's, it's had an impact on how she leads as a leader in her organization. So thanks, Janine. Really appreciate your willingness to kind of make that contribution. And uh, Liz, let's hear, Liz, did you, do you want to share something? Yeah. Liz is one yeah. of our was part of Partners Possibility and now lives in the UK and we miss you Liz. <laughs> Thank you. I don't I don't feel like I miss you yet because I'm still connected so <laughs> I've been jumping in here and there. Um, I vividly remember joining Old Mutual back in 2002 and about a year later I went on a big conference, a three-day conference in the Netherlands and I was so conscious of the huge amount of money that was being put into that. When I came back, I made a point of, of keeping a journal the whole time, documenting everything that I went to, and then putting that all into a PowerPoint presentation. But I then made a point of sharing throughout the whole organization in all the different pockets of project people. And it seemed to be the first time that that had happened. And it was something that I did intuitively. But I realized through that process, and, and I think the big learning point here is with everybody else who I subsequently managed, a huge amount of the stickiness of learning comes in immediately passing that learning on. So it is partly that reflecting process, but encouraging people not just to go away and attend something or to go away and participate in something, but to come back and then share it with others immediately. So it, it, it's taking that how would I apply this in my organization? But actually, how can I teach this to somebody else? How can I, and, and in doing that, there's a huge amount of insight that comes and in the Absolutely. conversations that happen. Absolutely, Liz. So, so I mean, yeah, you, you're reminding me. For yesterday evening, we had um, a celebration event of a group of, of business principals and business leaders have been part of PFP. And so one of the principals stood up, stood up and she said, I've been using... Um, I've not just been taking this for myself. I've had a very serious practice that every time I, I learn something as part of positive responsibility, I go back and I teach it to my, my team because I've realized my responsibility is to my team. So there's no doubt about it. As a mother, I get so excited when my, my daughters coach other people because I, because I know there's so much value that they get from coaching. So um, we're going to keep going and please invite, invite you to share anything that you want to share in your in the chat. But I, I want to quickly create an opportunity for Estelle to just, uh, Estelle had her hand up. And then Daryl and Yoki, if you're willing to, if you could put your notes, your thoughts in the chat, because we just, I'm, I'm keeping a close eye on time here. Estelle. Yeah, oh, thank you so much, Louise. Just want to say, you know, um, I said to you the 20% is a challenge for me. So what we've tried in our business and in certain parts, uh, some people would call it action learning, some would call it learning circles or whatever. So after the training, you know, they now need to reflect on it and say, how am I going to put this into practice? So this is the training. How can I apply it when I am in the field and how can I do it? And then it's, there's a discussion around that. And when the group would come together and say, well, I thought about it to do it this way and I thought about doing it this way and maybe, you know, we can do this or whatever. And they are learning through those circles. And then they need to go out and they need to apply and they need to just 
go and do the job, make the mistakes and see if it works or whatever. However, I do sometimes feel that the 20% is also a little bit forced, you know, uh, because there's a space you have to do it in and you have to do it now, something like that. So, yeah, that's my way. I do think it's working. But, yeah, if there's another way, I would love to hear from somebody. Thank you, Estelle. And that's what we're going to be sharing today. So we're going to share about what have we what have we learned now? now that we've had this amazing privilege to run a program for 10 years. We've had all these, these delegates. We've um, uh, we, we're going to share what we've learned. So um, so one of the core ideas for us in um, in in the, the, the in that 70 percent in the on the job or or taking our own experience seriously is um is just the most powerful learning that happens when we do that so as janine mentioned earlier so personally i'm just going to talk about my own experience i have um i was privileged enough to do an mba paid for myself so it was very important for me to get the most value from it and i don't think i've used more than 10 percent of that mba i'm not sure that that whole year and all of what i all those courses and sitting in all those classrooms uh you know i i don't think i can i really have received got a return on investment on that. So that's one kind of thing for me that I'm just very conscious of that, um, you know, I've done lots of courses and I've got beautiful, impressive files. And then I sit on a, on a, on a um, shelf. And then after a few years, I throw them away because I need to make place for more things. And the reality is a lot of that stuff hasn't led to any big change in my life. And I've been wondering, about that, but I'm also been, I've also been wondering about the fact that there are examples, there are things I've done in my life where I have learned a lot. So, so one of them, and it has been transformational, it's literally changed how I live my life. And a few, I just want to mention a few examples of those because I'm a strong believer in the, in the power of positive deviance and kind of looking at what works and what, what are the kind of, you know, what's the similarities about what works. So, but I've had a few experiences of real transformational change. One was um, the doc my doctorate. I was privileged enough to do that. And it was a collaborative inquiry into my own experience. That so was a really, it was a, you know, five years of, of focusing on the, on the 70%. And with a little bit of training and a little bit of 20%, but the majority was the 70%. And I just got so much value from doing that. Um, then, um, I did the Time to Think foundational course with Nancy Klein in 2008, and that has had a transformational impact on my life. I did the Common Purpose Meridian program, for those of you who've ever done any of those Common Purpose programs. That has had a massive impact and has fine, you know, ultimately led to me launching um, Partners of Possibility. My partner's possibility experience, being Red One Somebody's partner, has been transformational, and it's been a transformational experience for me to be a member of the PFP team. So in all of these instances, the learning happened for me personally from, from those three areas. I learned from doing and reflecting on doing. As Janine said, it's about the reflection that matters most. We've, I've learned from my interaction with others, so that social piece, and there was formal training involved in all of them. And what we've realized that it's just not enough to just have those three kinds of learning experiences. It's actually about the coherence of the design. So as a kind of, you know, another example, I'm currently right at this moment, I'm, I'm part of a global leadership development program with a very prestigious organization. I was given a bursary or a sponsorship to do this. International organization, amazing leaders from around the world, very senior leaders. You could argue that it's a 70 2010 program, but the reality is it's very badly designed and it therefore isn't likely to have any impact on me or other people. So I have asked for a, for a conversation with the CEO next week because, you know, I just don't think it's okay for them to have to do these programs and not think about the design. So I'm going to be sharing with you what we've learned from, and I just want to make sure that we also kind of meet you where you are because we have on this call people who have had lots of experience of partners possibility and then no experience of partners for possibility. 
Um, so we want to show you a very short video to just make sure that, that we're all on the same page and that you know what we're talking about, because a lot of the learning came from, you know, came from that experience. So if you don't know what the, the program is about, it, you might feel a bit lost. I'm just going to show you this video very quickly. It's only five minutes. And it just gives you a kind of executive overview of the Partners for Possibility process. Now, as you all know, this happens. The moment you want to make sure that you that you get that um, that you get a link, something happens to stop you from posting that link in your. Uh, so let me just quickly get this. So this is now the um, the five minute video. Uh, about Partners for Possibility as an extraordinary leadership development program. So here we go. And you should be getting some sound stuff now. Extraordinary leaders not only have the ability to build a real sense of community among colleagues, teams, and departments, but the power to create hope and change throughout our country. They empower, inspire, and uplift individuals in their own organizations, as well as in under-resourced schools where leadership skills are so desperately needed. These are the leaders that can bring South Africans together to initiate a ripple effect of positive change. These are the kind of leaders our country needs. Research shows that leaders learn more about leadership from being immersed in a challenging environment where there are no easy answers than from going to business school. Partners for Possibility is an award-winning field immersion experience for leadership development. Business leaders and school principals from under-resourced communities are partnered in a co-action and co-learning partnership to achieve maximum leadership for both parties. This multifaceted year-long program is carefully structured to incorporate 16 aspects of leadership development that build leadership capacity in different ways. The innovative 70-20-10 model incorporating action learning, social learning and formal training is designed to enable long-term sustainable change through resilient, socially conscious leadership. The experience is structured to deliver future-proof leaders who know how to apply key leadership skills in the real world. By being outside the office, you learn a lot more about your own self-leadership and general leadership than uh, you'd ever learn from a business school. Partners for Possibility has taught me to become a positive deviant and get rid of the negative norm. I learned that the most creative and innovative solutions come when you really listen to people. I've learned that people come up with their own solutions when you really listen to them with full attention. Being outside of my own context and connecting with people that I wouldn't normally do gave me a deep sense of appreciation and understanding for the work that we still need to do in this country. The Partners for Possibility program is strengthening the fabric of South African society by creating opportunities for people to work together across traditional boundaries. By spending time in communities outside their offices, business leaders develop a better understanding of the critical issues facing South Africa. The program is not only benefiting businesses. The development of socially conscious leaders has a significant impact within South African school communities too. Principals are empowered with skills, knowledge, and confidence to manage and lead their schools more efficiently, motivate their teachers, involve parents, and build networks of support to address the school's most pressing needs. Since the launch of the program, Partners for Possibility has strengthened leadership capacity in and around more than 1,000 schools across nine provinces. This has enriched the lives of more than 23,000 teachers and more than 750,000 learners. What also we learn from the Partners for Possibilities approach is that leadership is at the center of all developments in organizations and society. 
I note that the leadership approach targets the principal, but listening to the stories from the principals and the CEOs or the executives, it's very clear that the leadership approach is the leadership that plants seeds of leadership in everyone. Leaders who see possibilities instead of problems, who radiate with transformative energy, creating ripples of hope and positive change in the office and beyond. To join the more than 340 organizations that are contributing to South Africa's well-being while developing the kind of leaders that our country dearly needs, email pfp at symphonia.net or visit pfp4sa.org. I want to be a pilot. I want to be an engineer, a doctor. I want to be a robotic engineer. So, um, let me just stop the sharing here. So I hope you've enjoyed watching that. Um, just also want to say to you that um, if you did enjoy uh, watching that and want to know more and keen to hear more, the, that email address, pfp at symphonia.net, uh, will go to Kamala Pile, who's on the call. So you could just, you would immediately be able to connect to Kamala. But today we're not going to talk about partner responsibility as such. We're going to talk about the lessons we've learned from running a 70-20-10 program. And many of you have sent me messages to say, well, how do you integrate all these different things? And how do you get the 70 and the 20 and the 10 to work kind of seamlessly together? And that's what we're going to talk about now. So what I've done, I just want to see whether there's any, um, there's some messages here. There's some, a message from Mel about her impact. If anybody um, was, um, Curious to know whether that Liz doing you saw on screen is actually the, the, the Liz on the call. It is the same Liz. And uh, I think you saw Selvin on, the, on that message, on that um, video as well. So lots of people on the call re represented in that, in that video. So um, my promise was to sh share with you some of the lessons, not, not so much talk about the program itself. So let's go. Uh, I have developed some slides um, really just to kind of keep us on track and uh, but very keen to hear have you share any comments as we go i probably won't be able to see those comments um so i'm going to ask my colleagues to keep an eye open if anybody sees a comment that they feel we need to respond to either just respond immediately to the chat or um, let me know if i need to say something so i've realized we've realized that there are a few key enablers for um success and impact through these kind of programs and and they are, I think there's seven that we've, we've kind of highlighted here. So the first one is that the design, actually the, the reality is that if I, if I have to say there's only one thing you need to look at, it is about design. And you have to design for coherence. What happens so often, and I've seen this so often happen at specifically some of the business schools that I've been, been involved in that, there's lots of stuff being given to people, but there's no coherence. There's no kind of theory around how are all these different topics and models and ideas are working together to achieve the outcome that you want. So coherence is an important point, and we'll talk more about that. The second thing that's incredibly important is that you have to design for impact. Um, I am losing interest in doing leadership development for leadership development's sake. I, th I, I, I just don't think it has the kind of impact that we want to have and what we, what we would do, it would be good for us to really be clear when we, when we run a program around what is, the, what is the outcomes, what are the impacts that we want to see as a result of running this program. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we have to design in a way that will carefully weave all these aspects together. So again, we're going to share with you what we've been able to do in Partners Possibility, but there are lots of transferable ideas in that. You have to be clear about what your theory of change is, and, and, and that in, underpins the design, and then everything you do in your design has to kind of reflect that theory of change. What, what I'm I'll give you an example of this not happening and then you know just when it when it doesn't happen it it's almost like a slap in the face I'm I'm um, participating in a program on compassionate listening at the moment I was very curious to see what is the difference between the compassionate listening work and Nancy Klein's work 
Um, and we had our first session on Tuesday evening and it was a, and, and there was something happened that made me feel um, as a delegate that, that as a group, we were just not practicing what we were preaching. So the, the experience in the room wasn't an example of the theory. And, and for me, that is the kind of thing that, that then completely derails and devalidates, you know, it, it invalidates the, the whole program. Um, the, the, the fifth thing that's really important and we're going to talk about is about skillful facilitation. Uh, and we're going to talk about what we've learned around that's very much linked to what, what Estelle said earlier, this, this idea of what, what, what does it take to make the 20% work? And it is about skillful facilitation mostly. And then lastly, it's about choice. The one thing we have found in Partners for Possibility that when people choose to be part of PFB um, and they want to do it, almost inevitably there's great impact, but when they feel forced to do it or they kind of feel that there's an obligation or someone has an expectation that they will do it, the impact is either negative or, or just so small that it's actually not even worth looking at. And, and what we found, what I'm going to mention is just two of the reasons why that is so. The one is, um, comes from the research by a guy called Santiago Rincon Gallardo, who, who wrote an amazing book. And I'm, I've put the book on the screen here just in case anybody's interested. And I mean, he's just my, he's my euro when it comes to this stuff. But he, he talks about liberating learning and what do we need, how do we need to change education and schooling? But one of the core ideas that he talks about is this idea that learning is a, as a practice of freedom. When people want to learn something, the learning is far more sticky than when they feel com that they've, they've been mandated to do something. And then we know, because we believe very strongly in this, that if I cannot say no, my yes does not mean anything. So when people feel compelled to do something because some leader has decided we will all do this, and they feel they cannot say no, the yes doesn't mean much because it becomes lip service and compliance. And uh, we, we all know how to not um, get value from things that we don't believe in. Uh, so that's in terms of choice. What I want to, oh, sorry, and then um, theory of change. I want to talk, say two things. I can spend the entire day talking about theory of change, but I'm going to, I'm going to say two things and then I'm going to just have some additions to it, specifically with partners possibility. But the, the one is um, that we've discovered that, it, that if you want to have an impactful program, you have to look at the, the change and the, the development that will happen on three levels simultaneously. There will be change that will happen in the, in the life of the individual leader. That's what we call the I, the, the kind of impact on the individual leader. Then there are some changes that's going to happen as a result of this program in the we, in the in the relationships, in the organizational unit, in the, you know, the people working together and how they work together, the relatedness, the sense of community or not. And then lastly, the work, the what is it that we're trying to do? And it's the interrelationships between these th three aspects that lead to impact. And one of the things that we would advocate is to track the impact on all three of those levels, because there's no doubt that what happens with the individual leader has an impact on the relationship, but that's also, the relationship also has an impact on the individual leader. And our, then our attempt to do work together depends on the quality of our relationship, and that will then impact, our, the impact of our work will also have an impact on our relationship. So those continuous, the kind of um, symbiotic relationship between those three aspects and then tracking them that is a really important part but unfortunately we don't have lots of time to talk about more of that today. I want to just talk about one other model which is this idea that um, uh, a lot of what we do as leaders is dependent on the stories we tell and the pictures that we have about the world and that has an impact on how we are being which has an impact on, on how what we are doing. And um, the, the most impactful thing we can do in leadership development is to, is to work on the level of the seeing and the stories and the pictures, because that has a massive impact on the being and the doing. But what we typically do in leadership development and in training is we look at that we focus on the doing. 
um, and, and we don't pay enough attention to seeing and being. So that's another opportunity that we have with these kind of programs. And then lastly, for us, our theory of change is then very strongly informed by um, a theory of large-scale complex social change, which comes from my doctorate, uh, the theory you and the work by Otto Sharma and the Presencing Institute, and then the wisdom in these people who we've kind of in integrated in all of our work, Nancy Klein's three book, The Art of Possibility, uh, flawless consulting community the structure of belonging so that's just for us it's not i'm not saying that should be your theory of change but we have found that this um, work th there's a coherence in these different ideas that just bring about amazing impact um so i want to go into uh, the nine elements of design that we have identified as critically important when you want to have an impactful 70 2010 program uh, but before I do that, I just want to check whether um, I see there are a few people who have load shedding and I need to make Taryn. So, so our colleagues have also um, had load shedding issues. So I just need to make sure that I make one other person uh, um, a co-host so that we've got some coverage here. Um, and I'm not seeing any any other kind of comments from anybody? So if you're all happy with me just continuing, just want to check whether anybody else is putting their hand up and we're not seeing any unmute. So I'm assuming that you're still actively engaged and that you're still enjoying what you're hearing. So I'm going to share some thoughts about, and please let me know if that's not the case. I'm going to share some thoughts about the design piece because for us, we've really dis discovered that that's the most important thing. Um, so the first design element, and this, this will uh, resonate with, Daryl has been sending me some notes about this, and Daryl, I'm sure this is re going to resonate with you, is that there has to be a clear purpose. What are we trying to achieve with this program? So we know that um, purpose is one of the four conditions that drive intrinsic motivation. So it's important for us to be clear about what is our purpose, why are we doing this program? What are our expectations with regard to those three levels of change in terms of what are we hoping to see with regard to the individual leaders? And that will be that will be specific to those individual people. There isn't some, you can't have one kind of expectation across everybody because every single person will start the journey in a different place. So you need to meet them where they're at and then you need to kind of support their development in, in line with what they want, what they have in mind for themselves. You have to be clear about what your expectations are with regard to the teams, the groups, the organizational units. Um, you know, lots of clients are talking to us about um, topics like engagement. We want to, you know, we want to improve engagement uh, given COVID. Um, so that's a clear purpose then for a leadership development program. And then we need to be clear about our expectations with regard to the work that we need to do. So what do I mean? Uh, clients would talk to us about the fact that they have a new strategy that they need to implement or a new operating model, or they need to become more agile and flexible, or they need to make uh, hybrid teams work. You know, what is the work that we need to do? Because if we can clearly identify what that work is, then we have a much better chance of being successful in terms of implementing that. Um, then we need to be clear about what success will look like. How will we measure the impact on those three levels and how will we know whether we have been successful? So that's element number one in term, design element number one is purpose. Design element number two is, is about the learning community. So we heard earlier from Estelle saying a little bit about what they're doing um, in NetBank. Um, we know that connectedness and relatedness is another one of the four conditions that drive intrinsic motivation. People feeling a sense of kind of I'm working with a group of people who's supporting my change and I'm uh, because we know we learn most and best in a safe community of peers. And when we have an immersion experience, we experience new ways of being and doing. And we heard earlier from Janine, she was kind of um, validating this that um, by, by a new way of being and doing, experiencing that, it kind of becomes part of how you, how you do things and you go back into your own organization and it has an impact. Um, we find that these learning communities, leadership circles, communities of practice, whatever you want to call them, become the sand pit to experience, um, experiment with new behaviors and practices. So once you've got the confidence from, 
from doing it in a safe environment with people who you have developed a relationship with, it spills into other areas of our lives. And we keep hearing this. We keep hearing people say, I've ha learned how to listen in my community of practice or in my, my learning community. And I've taken those ideas back home. We heard yesterday, one of the guys said, I have, I, I have found my voice. And now I am expressing myself better and I've learned how to say what I want in other areas. Um, in the learning community, if you set it up well, and, and this, is this is the important piece, Estelle, from a, how do you do this well, there has to be a, 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 um, a contracting around the balance between challenge and support. I remember my learning community when I did my doctorate was so out of balance. It was very challenging and not very supportive and it makes it hard to learn them. So how do you contract for a challenge, a balance between challenge and support? That's where the skillful facilitation comes in. Um, we, we have discovered that one of the most important roles for the learning community is for people, is to confront people by, with their gifts. And so when I get confronted by my gifts, um, with my gifts by people who care and I I discover that I matter and my voice is important. Um, a lot of the theory around belonging, inclusion, and voice gets activated. And then, lastly, the role of the um, learning community is also uh, it's the, the learning community has a has a role and a responsibility with regard to accountability. So, my members of my learning community will hold me accountable when I don't keep my promises, when I don't do as I said I was going to do, whether I act in, in a way that's different from the commitment that we made somewhere along the line on this, on this journey. So, for example, if I've learned how to create a thinking environment and how to be a thinking partner on my journey, uh, and later on I just talk over people and I interrupt them and I don't create a space for them to do their best thinking, chances are someone in my learning community is going to call me on that. And that's one of the ways in which the learning becomes so sticky. So that's design element number two is around the learning community and that's part of the 20%. What I will do um, in a few minutes is I'm going to pull it all together. I'm going to talk about how those these design elements then specifically look at the 70 and the 20 and the 10. Um, the third design element is um, the, a process over time. So the one thing we've discovered through PFP is that learning is a process. It's not an event. And the idea, the, you know, I, we often talk about, you can go to a two-day course, it's fabulous, but it does feel a bit like a hot bath if you don't, if it's not embedded and contextual. So we think the ideal time frame for a learning journey, which, which doesn't mean there's an end to your learning, but there's an end to this phase of the learning, is about 12 months. I keep hearing with partners possibility, we keep being challenged that 12 months is not enough. We know it's not enough. We'd love to do more. We need to figure out how to do that. But, but, but there's something about that kind of calendar year that, that gives us an opportunity to pause and reflect and say, where do we go from here? What's our next um, part of the journey? We know that psychological safety is critical for learning and trust, and both of those take time to develop. It's not something that you can do in, in too short a period of time. For some people, I mean, we have seen time and time again that kind of at that six, seven, eight month mark is when people start to really discover their ability to contribute and, and behave and act differently in that, in that environment. Um, Another part, one of these um, uh, contributors to intrinsic motivation is mastery. And what happens when people start to develop, you know, for example, let's say someone said yesterday, my, my intention was to develop my capacity to be um, more assertive. Um, and that takes time. It, 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 it's, you know, the, the one experience builds on another. And so if you give people an opportunity to to develop mastery over a period of time, then that gives them confidence to go out in other areas of their lives. Um, it teaches us grit and tenacity. Um, in the early days when we were developing PFP, I had a long conversation with Phil Mervis, who some of you will have attended some of the sessions we've done with Phil, but 
but he was talking about how he's seen other 70-20-10 programs that were in a much shorter period of time, and then they didn't get the benefit of the grit and tenacity and resilience that we get from a more longer program, because it's, you go through the honeymoon phase, and you have to keep going and keep, you know, uh, delivering on your promises, and in that, there's huge value for people. Um, I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm talking a lot, so I'm going to stop after this design element and just hear whether anybody wants to say something. So uh, what we also see in this, um, when it's in a, a journey that's over time, is that there's enormous um, value in the feedback and encouragement that people get from their peers after 12 months of working together. And what happens is that these then lead to deep and meaningful friendships. Um, which we know are key elements for engagement and communities of belonging at work. So all of the Gallup work has, has taught us how important those development of deep and meaningful friendships are. So, um, I, you know, I'm kind of worried about um, not, not walking my own talk in terms of all of the speaking I'm doing from my side, uh, but I want to make sure that I give you everything that, I, that we kind of share as, as abundantly and as we can, because we've got so much to share. But let me just pause here for a moment and hear whether anybody wanted to make a comment or say something about those three first three design elements that I've talked about so far. I've got six more to go. No, now I'm wondering whether anybody's still here. Daryl. Yeah, Louise, I think um, I love what, what you're describing. So as a learning designer myself, it resonates so strongly. Um, but the bit that I wanted to just highlight in what you're saying is around how we need to be so deliberate and intentional in designing the community as much as we need to do on designing content, on process, on all of those things is that um, the community will not just evolve into what we need it to be of its own accord. And we have to be as deliberate and intentional in thinking about and designing that community and the purpose that it serves in those bullet points that you were listing just now, um, those, those friendships don't just automatically happen. They are a product of. Um, the same space doesn't just happen. It's very carefully curated and, and developed. And, and I think that for me is a, is a key thing linking to our earlier point around how do you retain the high touch? Because this is where this whole face-to-face -face virtual thing is in this com sense of community and belonging and so on. And I think it, yeah, for me, what you've highlighted is the criticality of being deliberate and intentional in designing your community. Absolutely. And, and, I, mean, and I think Daryl, that's what, so I had a conversation yesterday with a client who we, put forward a proposal for a quite a well thought through um, uh, program. And they made the decision that they wasn't, they weren't going to have external, they weren't going to have facilitation, group of engineers. They're just going to kind of oh, get a group of people together and they're going to, somehow it's going to happen miraculously. And I realized, I realized, you know, professionally, I probably made a, made a big mistake to, to allow them to think that that's going to be possible for them to have impact if they don't carefully create and, and, and facilitate. So let me keep going because I'm conscious of time and then hopefully uh, it will just, because I'm just, I know that I'm just leaving you with lots of food for thought and hopefully there will be another opportunity to discuss this further. Um, so I want to keep going. I want to go to number, the fifth, fourth element of design. Sorry, the, we, we talked about the first three. So the fourth element of design um, is has about the the journey map. So what we've discovered is that if you want people to say yes to a year long program or whatever, you have to be really clear around how things are going to work out. So for partners possibility, we have been you know this does, this is our journey map. It shows the journey over fifty four weeks. It shows at the top, it shows those, um, the, 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 the workshops, our community of practice. It, it has the, the theory U element. It looks very clearly about what the outcomes are that we are hoping to achieve. Um, and then it shows our coaching and, and now, now our latest design, we've, we've actually designed it into these three phases. So 
this is our version of the, the story that you're going to have your own version. The point is just that if we want to develop 70, 20, 10 programs, we have to be clear about the journey map. And it's not, I think sometimes that the idea of, well, it will emerge is actually just lazy design. And um, from this other workshop I'm doing at the moment, or this program I'm doing at the moment, I, I keep being confronted with the fact that I don't think the, the, the program designers have really thought this through. And that makes me as a delegate feel very, very kind of, uh, I disrespect it, I think is the word. Design element number five, and this is the point that um, Daryl made earlier, is skillful facilitation. And this also links to, to um, Estelle's points earlier and a few others. So we have discovered, or well not discovered, we have fine-tuned the role that we call a learning process facilitator. So this is someone who has coaching skills, who's also a facilita facilitator and, and has can project manage a journey. Um, and the reason why it's all three of those is firstly coaching. Now, I know we've got lots of coaches on this call, but my experience is that sometimes coaching can, can support narcissism. And that coach is in that room with one with a person and they get a particular, it can even support victimhood in some ways. I'm, I know that, I'm, you know, coaches are very skilled in this, but here's what I've seen. I've seen that the person, the story that the coach is being told when the coaching is not in context is very different from how that person shows up in, in with peers. So when we have one person as coach and facilitator, they see what happens when the person is with another group. So in the kind of, you know, they're all soft and fluffy in the, in the coaching session, but then in another session, they just bulldoze everybody and they take all the airtime and they're the person who has all the answers. But if the coach never sees that, then the coach isn't in the same position to provide that support in terms of their development. So, we have also found in you know, preparing, speaking to Daryl's point earlier, that the curation and support and careful facilitation around preparing for training, then reflecting on doing and learning and being challenged and, and creating opportunities, you know, or, or reflecting on being challenged. Um, the, 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 the LPF will provide support with regard to capturing the insights and the stories and will provide a perspective you know, even that, like Janine was saying earlier, she's asking the question, what have we learned this week? That's typically what the LPF will do, because if people are left to their own devices, chances are they're not going to ask themselves that question. Uh, the LPF also has a responsibility to spot learning moments, so a behavior, a practice, or something that happened that gives us an opportunity to kind of, you know, the, the, the delegate made a promise to deliver a document on a particular day, then they don't deliver that document. Well, that gives us a great opportunity to talk about, well, how's that showing up in other periods of your life? Or they consistently arrive late or they consistently, you know, multitasking while they're in the session, or whatever those learning moments and opportunities are. Um, and, and we have found time and time again in PFP that the business leaders and the principals say, you know, that, that the fact that the, the LPF was present and attentive and saw what was going on was so powerful and had so much impact for them. And then the LPF's responsibility is to remind, amplify, connect, strengthen, encourage, challenge. And again, I can do a whole day and just on the role of the, the, the learning process facilitator. The last thing we're asking learning process facilitators to be to do, and I don't think you can be a learning process facilitator if you don't do this, is to model being a lead learner. Now, Again, whole theory behind this, but Santiago in his work was really, he said, um, so often we find in schools, for example, that children are not learning. And the reason why they're not learning is because they never see adults learning. They see adults teaching, but they don't see adults learning. And so what we want the learning process facilitators to do is to model authenticity, vulnerability, openness to learning, growth mindset, all of those, and in that creates an opportunity for other people to do the same. So, so the development and support and whatever of learning process facilitators in my mind is key. I keep making predictions. I think 10, 10 years from now, 95% of all learning will be supported by learning process facilitators. So better we start an academy for learning process facilitators so that we can have uh, thousands of them to support 
uh, local learning happening in, in companies and, and, and towns across the country. But that's a conversation for another day. Design element number six is about clear contracting with regard to expectations. These kind of programs mean that, that it, there's a lot of self-directed learning and activity that happens. And what we as designers have to do is to be very clear about what those are. So for example, there will be formal training. These are the dates, the times, this is how it's going to be delivered face-to-face -face or, or, or virtual. Here's what we, you need to commit, commit to reading because it's, it's done on a flipped classroom basis. So there's not going to be lots of kind of theory being done in the workshop because it's designed for adult learning. So our expectation is you're going to do this reading or listening in preparation for the training. Um, then we need to be clear around what are we expecting with regard to learning community meetings, the coaching, expectation with cross-boundary work, who are the other people that we're expecting you to engage with, this whole curation of the learning community, what are the expectations outside of the formal sessions, um, and then what is our experience, uh, our expectation with regard to taking your own experience uh, seriously? What, what will be the site of learning that we're going to be using for this program. So with Partners Possibility, the site of learning is the change program at the school, but it could easily be, you know, being a production manager with a with a with a team that's half virtual, half at the office. That's a fantastic site of learning. Or leading the, you know, the operating model change program, or being part of the team that's designing or whatever. That's beautiful. Those are beautiful sites of learning. But if we're going to take those at sites of learning, we need to contract around how are we going to, um, you know, get the information we need, how are we going to track impact, what is going to be the shift that we're looking for, and, and quite a lot of work needs to be done uh, up front with regard to what is it we're trying to do. So with PFP, it's easy. We're trying to see impact in a school at all those different very levels. But so from a design perspective, that's a really important point, being clear about what the shift is that we're looking for with regard to the site of learning. Now, again, let me um, stop there for a moment. I've got three more to go, and then we also want to talk about these other things, but just in case anybody's dying to say something. Um, any, I'm just going to quickly see uh, around chat. So, Tracy, we will send the, we will send the, um, the, the, the presentation afterwards, we will send that out. Um, and then Daryl's kind of giving us lots of input here. Thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, anybody else who, who desperately need to say something, want to say something now, or should I keep going? Not seeing um, any unmutes or any hands, so I'll keep, oh, if sorry, I, Tracy. I ask just to pop back to a, a concept prior. When we speak hmm. about mastery, how do we manage or gauge if we are mirroring or conducting mastery as that? Maybe our assumption is this is good practice, but actually in reality, it might not be. Can you just help us understand a little bit more about, can you give us an example, Tracy? Because I'm not entirely sure that I understand what you mean. Okay. Um, thank you. Say, for example, um, the leader that I am being mentored by or following performs certain practices in a certain way. And I'm told, or I believe that this is the right way to move forward. This is the correct practice to, to emulate, only to find out potentially that wasn't the best and there is um, fallback in that regard. But in the same instance, that is my leader. That is the person that I'm supposed to be uh, mirroring. Oh, Tracy, that's a big topic. <laughs> so, so part of what... Um, this is exactly the, the kind of thing that I think would be amazing um, for a 70-20-10 program, because we bring those practices into the, into the learning community, into the training, into the coaching, uh, into my work. There's going to be an opportunity for me to say, how's that working for me? You know, I keep hearing, I was on a call recently with a leader who's so, you know, he's so certain and his job is to kind of push things through and get people to do what he wanted. And he was kind of going... And at one point, we just asked him one question. We said, how's that working for you? And his face fell and he said, it's not working. <laughs> Fantastic. Now we have something to talk about and there's an opportunity for us to explore. So, so Tracy, I can't say to you that there's a clear answer. All I know is that that's the kind of 
flight of learning work that we can bring to this program, which which inevitably would lead to new insights, I'm hoping. Thank but you. I think, I think the answer I was looking for, um, Irene, though, is that only reflection can really teach us what to do and what not to do. And if we had the magic wand, we'd use it. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks for that challenging question. Um, design, sorry, design, another part of this clear contracting, and this is something that we've learned the hard way in PFP is that we have to be very clear around how we're going to monitor and evaluate the impact because that might need some deliverables. And if we're going to want deliverables from our participants, we have to contract that upfront. And we have to, that, you know, they have to say yes to that, that expectation as well. Otherwise, we're going to be, you know, mo moaning and groaning the whole time. Design element number seven is that we have to walk our talk. Um, now, the picture here, so the experience and the design has to be an expression of our theory. This is something that I learned from Peter Block early in my career, and it's just had such an impact on me. So, for example, in PFP, we have decided that um, Daniel King's core theory of success is a critical um, kind of uh, part of our theory of change. That it's that the quality of everything we do depends on the quality of our thinking, and that depends on the quality of our relationships. And so um, we have to invest in relationships and we have to invest in thinking. So that's a core kind of design element for us, which means that we have been doing lot, lots of things, and I'm just gonna mention a few, to make sure that that, is, that permeates everything we do on the journey. So for example, we have these cross-sector co-learning and co-action partnerships where we investing a lot in terms of working on the quality of the relationship. We, we our, our formal training modules, Time to Think, Flawless Consulting, Community Building, are all designed with that um, outcome in mind. Uh, we very, very intentionally and carefully create thinking environments and, and it's part of how we do things. Uh, we've implemented Theory U. And so Theory U says we have to invest in the quality of the relationship before we can start doing work, doing work together. So that's just an example of, and, and, and then we keep checking ourselves. Are we walking our talk? Is, is, is what we're doing today in line with what we have committed to do as part of our design? Design element number eight, and this is a really important thing. I think there are a few people on the call who've sent me some questions that particularly speaks to this. Is In an ideal world, our, our formal learning will be just in time. So again, drawing on what we've done with partners' possibility, uh, we do time to think is our formal learning before, just after they've, we've launched the program. And then the time to think work is supports the outcome that we're expecting in phase one of the journey. Open heart, open mind, open will, a strong relationships, a good understanding um, uh, for, for the business leader and the principal to, to be thinking partners to each other rather than an unequal partner relation, you know, all of that. So that then gives them, we give them the two day training or in, in PP, it's a, it's a day or three module training and then they go away and they go and practice it. And they go and apply it and they get feedback and they get challenged and the coach would support them on that journey, the LPF. The next thing is flawless consulting. Bottom of the U, that's where they learn how to contract for generative reciprocal adult to adult relationships. And then that gives, sets them up for the next fees. And then when they're ready to get the community involved, we, we, they do the two-day community building workshop. So, so the point here is really just to say that every one of these, as, if you do the training and you deliver it just in time, then it, the, the, it kind of improves the, the, the stickiness and it improves the impact that you will ultimately see. Very conscious of time. I'm way, way behind what I, where I wanted to be at this point, but let's keep going. So the last one is around open-mindedness. Now, um, Harvard uh, many years ago has felt that when leaders arrived in, in Boston to come and do an MBA, they were, many of them were quite defended and they weren't open to learning and they were so careful around how they show up. So they came up with this idea of field immersion experience for leadership development. They sent people out into the world to go and do really difficult things, brought them back, had them, they, they came back much more humble than what they arrived and then they're open to learning. For us, um, we've put business leaders in schools. Now, any business leader who thinks they know what, you know, what should happen in a school is a bit deluded. So, so there's, there's a kind of 
the, the design and 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 the site of learning will make it possible will, will make it um, almost impossible for people to, to remain remain closed minded. For principals, we're giving them probably the most difficult task in education, which is to, to mobilize the community around the school. So, so the, the point is just, I don't know, know what your reality is, but it's to create something that will lead to open-mindedness. So those are the, the, the nine design elements that um, we have found are really critical in, um, in PFP. Uh, we've also, um, there's obviously some things that we've done in PFP that's not so applicable maybe to other in-company programs. So I've got a list here of the things that we think make PFP extra special. So I'm not going to talk about that today. If anybody at any point wants to have a conversation, then I'm very happy to do that. I want to talk just about those, um, about the, the, the three elements. And then I want to just briefly talk about um, monitoring and evaluation, which is something that many people have asked about. Um, so if I go back to my screen. So what we've learned about the three elements is firstly, um, in terms of formal learning, we've learned that we have to really ensure that the individual models, because there's less opportunity to be in a classroom, every moment in that classroom has to count. So it has to be designed for adult learning. Talked about just in time, ideally modular, delivered either virtually or face to face. So I just want to, you know, Daryl said earlier that the challenge with, with virtual is that you don't get that same, same sense of community. We have all of our preconceived ideas about that has been challenged through COVID, Daryl. We have seen amazing sense of of closeness and a sense of community can be built online. It's harder, but if you have a learning process facilitator who's comfortable online, the whole team benefits from that. So happy to have that conversation offline around how to make that happen. Um, in PFP, as I said, we've got our, our three modules we've already talked about. Now we are continuously surprised and in awe of the impact that we see. Um, so UNISA did a study of, about the impact of partners' possibility on business leaders. And it, I mean, all of us were completely blown away by what we read. Uh, we have numerous case studies. We've written two books. So last year I had the opportunity to, to publish, to write a book the year before last, actually it was published last year. But, um, and we went around and we had in, you know, conversations with people and um, my 85 year old mother read the book uh, recently and she said, oh, Louise, I also want to do this training. And I thought, oh, wow, how fabulous it is that, you know, if someone at her age can, can identify that the impact of, of this training and this process on individual people. Um, we've seen, I have been personally very surprised by the stickiness of the learning. And I've realized that it, it has to do with what happens before the training, what happens after the training, so what happens before and what happens after, in many ways, I think it's it's 50% of the impact comes from what happens before and after. And if you just do a two-day training course and you haven't done the before and after, I don't know whether it's possible to, to see the same kind of stickiness. In terms of the learning from doing piece, which is the kind of taking your own experience seriously, for us, that's the main site of learning. I'm personally a bit hesitant around the term action learning. What I've seen too often, and many of our clients have talked about it, is that people have they've, they've kind of created projects for the sake of a, of a learning, you know, a leadership development program. And then, you know, they spend all this effort and time on this project, but then nothing actually happened because it's not really something that the business is going to take up. So personally, I think there's a much more value to make your site of learning your day job rather than creating a, a, a project for the sake of the learning development program. Um, and then just to kind of reiterate what Janine said earlier, we don't learn much from only doing. We learn a lot, a lot from doing and then reflecting on the doing by taking our own experience seriously and obviously lots of different uh, reflective modalities, autoethnography, reflective writing, discovery writing, thinking partnerships, thinking councils, all of those. And again, would love to have anybody who wants to know more, we're happy to engage further on those. And then lastly, the social learning, which Estelle said earlier is the thing that she struggles most with. We think that is the glue. 
and it is the most important aspect and it makes or break these kind of programs. It's the most challenging to get right. The learning process facilitator is the key. There's no doubt about that. It's about in context coaching, group facilitation, the learning community, which then becomes the secondary site of learning. So uh, I was going to end the session with asking you to do some reflective writing just on what did you take away from the session, but we've kind of we, we've run out of time. So, so I am going to ask you to just take a moment and to ask yourself, what have I taken away from today? And if you are willing to share that in a spirit of generosity in the chat, and then Taryn is also posting a request for you to click on an evaluation form. But if you're willing to share just, you know, one or two things that you've taken away from this conversation today, um, that would be incredibly helpful. And um, yeah, and then we've got, um, We've got five minutes to hear any feedback, thoughts, responses from anybody. And I'm just keeping my eyes on anybody wants to unmute themselves and, and just share your thoughts or reflections. Liz. I know Elizabeth always sounds like I'm in trouble. Um, I think it just, again, emphasizes the point that the quality of your doing depends on the quality of your thinking and the fact that there is the continual thinking and reflection about how is this going why is it working what are we doing that's working what needs to change that's the key and it's the key in everything so the nancy klein stuff is kind of fundamental absolutely nancy klein reflective writing or technology you know there's different ways the point is just that if we just kind of keep doing we won't get the learning and that none of this will be beneficial. And so you can go to hundreds of courses, but if you don't pause and say, what have I done today? Did it work? Why did it work? Why did it not work? If you don't go through that, if you don't do that work, and that's why it doesn't come naturally, that's why being part and being facilitated and being supported by a learning process facilitator who helps you to do that is so absolutely critical. Um, and thank you very much for people for, um, uh, sharing their takeaways in the chat. It's just wonderful, love that. Um, any last thoughts? We've got three minutes to go. And you are very welcome to unmute yourself and share your thoughts. No, have we done? Are we done then today? So I also want to say to you that um, the, the Partners for Possibility team are running some information sessions and, um, if, and we will send you the information about that. If anybody's interested um, to know more about Partners for Possibility, Kamala's on the call, so you can just kind of post any questions that you might have about that. Um, I'm personally very keen to see whether we can make 70 2010 uh, the way we do things in, um, in leadership development. So I would love to connect with anybody who's interested in continuing that conversation. Kamala, I see you unmuted. <clears throat> yeah, Louise, there was a, a question or a comment, and I just can't find it now in the chat early on. Uh, someone was saying to get the, the learning from formal from the, from the close classroom intervention to stick is so important. So I quite like how you ended the, your, your presentation talking about the learnings and that fertile ground before and the application after. I think that is from my own personal experience, so, so important. And, you know, when, when I was in corporate and going for attending lots of courses, which is one of the big advantages of being in co corporate, Definitely that that fertile ground before and that um, the, the the practice afterwards that was always lacking. So I think there there is a big opportunity for, for corporates there. Thank you, Kamala. So Kamala is the new program director for Partners of Possibility. She was a delegate on the program and loved it so much that she left her very cushy corporate life. And sorry, Kamala, probably not that all that cushy, but a fabulous corporate life, corporate job to come and join the Partners for Possibility team. So um, with that, I think we wanna keep our, well not think, we do wanna keep our promise in terms of time. Uh, we will send you the recording, uh, Taryn, just make a note, we'll send the recording and then we'll also send the, the um, slides I used and uh, very happy to continue the conversation with anybody interested. So thank you very much everybody and have a good rest of your day. 
Thanks, Louise. Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Louise. Bye. Hi, Louise. <laughs> Thank Bye. you.